we're on our way to Mars. I find that absolutely incredible. But we have several folks, Elon Musk and his SpaceX project. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars more than anybody else. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. And you saw a SpaceX launch earlier. Elon Musk plans to have his rockets ready by 2022 to take cargo to Mars, by 2024 to take astronauts to Mars. SpaceX has achieved almost all of its goals on time. So I think we have no reason to doubt that it is possible that we will have humans on the surface of Mars by 2024. Wow. That actually scares me. Okay? <laughs> now, something you should recognize about the SpaceX project is that SpaceX may have the ability to get astronauts to Mars. They do not yet have the ability to bring anyone home from Mars. <laughs> they do not yet have the ability to find the water they need to survive on Mars or to protect themselves from harsh radiation from space to survive on Mars. So the first astronaut to Mars, they may be on a one-way trip that they may not return from. That's an important thing for you to think about. But Elon Musk is not the only player in this game. Jeff Bezos and his Blue Origin project, Blue Origin wants to go to Mars, not immediately. Jeff Bezos wants to put humans in, to work in space around the Earth and then go to the moon and then go to Mars, but he does plan to go to Mars. <laughs> I didn't know that slide was there. Right. That's pretty good. I mean, I just, I'm not going to Mars anytime soon, but we can talk about that. Right? But, but get the book. All right. NASA, as you know, NASA is planning to go to Mars in the 2030s. NASA's plans right now to go to Mars do not include immediately setting foot on Mars, but going to the Mars system, because if you go to orbit around Mars, you can actually bring your NASA astronauts home. And since you are paying your tax dollars for the NASA program, you probably want your astronauts to have a chance to come home again. So that's the way they're playing right now. The United Arab Emirates has announced they want to build a city on Mars by 2117. They do not have rockets yet, but they do have plans to build a city on Mars. And the Mars One group out of the Netherlands is, already has an astronaut corps. They do not have rockets either. They're planning to buy off-the-shelf components from Boeing or Lockheed or someone else. But they're planning to go to Mars. So there are at least five different groups planning to go to Mars. Whether we get there in the 2020s or the 2030s or the 2040s or the 2050s, there are a lot of folks in this room who are likely to be alive when humans set foot on Mars. And that is absolutely incredible. Whether it's a good idea or not, that's a different question. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about. So let me take you back a little bit. Early in the, the early days of telescopes, Christian Huygens discovered, made a major discovery about Mars, and that is that it rotates in 24 hours. It's actually about 24 hours and 39 minutes. We got that corrected later on. But this is his original sketch of Mars. It's not as pretty as the pictures you saw of Mars earlier. In the 1660s, you had to actually draw a sketch of Mars with your hand. But this is what he saw, and what he saw on the surface of Mars, we can actually identify now what he was looking at. But by 1670, we knew that Mars rotated in 24 hours. There is another planet you know about that rotates in about 24 hours. Anybody identify that planet? Never. All right. The next big discovery about Mars, and you've already seen this in some images, is that Mars has polar caps. There's another planet you know about that has polar caps. And by the end of the 18th century, William Herschel discovered that Mars's rotation axis is tilted about 25 degrees from the direction of the sun which means Mars has seasons. Now, if you put all that together, by the turn of the centuries, from the 1700s to the 1800s, what did we know about Mars? Mars had a 24-hour day, just like the Earth. It has a year with about twice as many days as the Earth, but similar to the Earth. It has polar caps, it has seasons, it has a thin atmosphere, it has a solid surface. Astronomers had come to the conclusion that Mars is an Earth-like planet. It might be another Earth. What then happened in the 19th century is astronomers really turned Mars into another Earth. They made a lot of observations that were <coughs> over-interpreted, over-zealously interpreted, perhaps. But we created an idea 
that there could be life on Mars. These two folks are pretty important. In the 1830s, these two German astronomers spent a decade mapping the surface of Mars, and they came up with this map. This is the map of the Southern <laughs> Hemisphere, and the thing marked with the letter A at the left-hand side, that's what Huygens was looking at in the 1650s and 1660s. But what they concluded is that the dark areas they saw on Mars were oceans and the light areas were continents because Mars is just like the Earth. So the next round of mapping of Mars understood Mars as being like the Earth where the dark areas are ocean and the light areas are continents. So we get maps like this. This is from 1880. But in this map, you start seeing features in the maps of Mars where they're labeled as continents and oceans. We have the Dawes Ocean, the Dawes Continent. He got lots of stuff named after him. The Herschel <laughs> Continent. Uh, almost none of these names survived till today. But by the 1880s, we had this image that Mars had continents and Mars has oceans. Mars does not have continents like the Earth. Mars does not have oceans like the Earth. But this has colored our thinking about Mars since that time. This also was the first appearance of the word canal on Mars. And canals then got a, a robust but bad history on Mars. The canals don't exist, but again, the idea of canals became part of our thinking about Mars. What I want to do for the rest of my time is talk to you about what I think is the most important set of discoveries on Mars in terms of understanding whether there is life on Mars or is not life on Mars. And that has to do with methane. And the methane era, the scientific era of studying methane, began in 1969 when we launched the Mariner 7 mission. Launched on March 27th, got to Mars on August 5th. You need to remember the date, August 5th. There will be a quiz in a few moments. <laughs> because two days later, on August 7th, NASA held a press conference. And the press conference was to announce the results from that work. Now, what you just saw from the measurements from Mars Observer? Mars Express. Mars Express. For the lake on Mars, data from 2012 to 2015 is now three years later. They've been analyzing that data for years. That's why I think we can probably expect that they got the right answer. August 7th, that's two days after the spacecraft flew past Mars at a press conference to announce the results. Now, George Pimentel, who's pictured here, was the principal investigator on the instrument on that spacecraft called the Infrared Spectrometer. George Pimentel is one of the, the giants of 20th century chemistry. There's a statue on the UC Berkeley campus of George Pimentel. He's a, a great scientist. At that press conference, he said, we are confident that we have detected gaseous methane and gaseous ammonia between approximately 21, 61 degrees and 76 degrees south latitudes on Mars. Newspapers on August 9th <laughs> said, two gases associated with life found on Mars near the polar cap, Mariner hints life on Mars. The world suddenly knew we'd found gases on Mars that almost certainly tell us there is life on Mars. About a month later, uh, I'm sorry, another quote from that same press conference from Kenneth Kerr, who was on the spectrometer team. Kenneth Kerr said, I have no clue as to the origin of these gases. He should have stopped right there. Okay? <laughs> because up to that point, he was correct. Okay? But he continued, but if the readings are true, and I believe they are, we have to face the possibility that they could be of biological origin. Methane means life. All right, so September 11th, another news conference. George Pimentel says, the spectral features previously attributed to methane and ammonia were, in fact, caused by frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice. He continued, the new discovery removed one of the final hopes scientists held of finding life on the planet. Not really. Okay. <laughs> the fact that carbon dioxide can mimic the behavior of methane and ammonia was just a cruel coincidence. Not really. Okay. <laughs> if they had spent a couple months, let alone years, analyzing that data, there never would have been those headlines in the newspapers saying, we probably found hints of life on Mars. But astronomers, I think, want to find life on Mars. 
Laura asked me this the other day. Do you want to find life on Mars? I think it would be pretty neat. Right? <laughs> I think it would be phenomenal. But it's the wrong question. But I think the idea that astronomers have wanted to find life on Mars have colored our interpretations of our measurements for a long time and led us in wrong directions. And this is one of them. But the methane idea is a good one. And here's why. <laughs> a cow eats grass. The grass goes into one of its many stomachs. The bacteria digest it, and it ferments, and it produces hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas. And then in another stomach, there are methanogens that turn those gases into methane. And the methane comes out of the cow in both directions. <laughs> and the atmosphere of the Earth fills up with methane. So this pie chart tells you where the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from. We have rice paddies where there are bacteria in the soil producing methane. We have landfills where there's bacteria producing methane. We have ruminant livestock like cows and sheep and llamas and camels that produce methane. We have termites that produce methane. A hundred percent of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from biology. How much methane is there? I've got a number in the top corner for you, about 1,800 parts per billion in the Earth's <laughs> atmosphere. So if you had one billion atoms or molecules from the Earth's atmosphere, 1,800 of them would be methane. That's a lot of methane. If you were on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy and you could point a telescope at the Earth, you could detect that methane in the Earth's atmosphere. It would be easy to detect that methane. And there's another set of numbers up there on this slide. The methane in the Earth's atmosphere can survive for about 12 years. In our environment, with all the oxygen in the atmosphere, with the ultraviolet light coming in from the sun, the methane gets destroyed in only 12 years. So the presence of methane in the Earth's atmosphere, simultaneously with the presence of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, tells you that there is something on the Earth producing the methane. And on the Earth, that's life. There are no other sources that can produce that volume of methane. If you had that telescope on the other side of the Milky Way, you could prove that life exists on Earth by measuring the presence of methane gas in the Earth's atmosphere. That is what has drawn astronomers to study methane in the atmosphere of Mars. That's what the Mariner 7 scientists were looking for half a century ago. Unfortunately, they found carbon dioxide instead. But for the last 50 years, we have been searching for methane in Mars's atmosphere. In Mars's atmosphere, the methane can last a bit longer, 300 years. And that means if you find methane in Mars's atmosphere today, it did not exist a thousand years ago, or a million years ago, or a billion years ago. Something is making the methane. Could be life. So search for methane. It's an incredibly good powerful idea for understanding life on Mars. Now, if you're using a telescope on the Earth, you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, you're looking through Mars's atmosphere, it's very difficult to make these measurements. So while people have tried to do that, we have sent a spacecraft to Mars to measure methane on the surface of Mars, in the atmosphere of Mars. So the Curiosity rover landed in 2012. This is a selfie by the Curiosity rover. In 2015, the Curiosity rover team announced that they had, in 2013, excuse me, they announced that they had not detected any methane on Mars. They had spent two years making these measurements, and the amount of methane they found was less than one-fifth of one part per billion. Now, that doesn't mean they'd found one-fifth of one part per billion. It means they hadn't found any methane. They could not detect methane, which suggested that life is not producing methane on Mars. However, in December of 2015, they made a new announcement. And in that announcement, they said that in January and February of 2014, they had detected methane. The amount of methane was seven parts per billion, not 1,800 parts per billion, but a significant amount of methane. And there is nobody who disputes that measurement. That's an accurate measurement. They detected methane on Mars. The question is, where does it come from? So I've got a cartoon here for you with some possible sources of production for the methane. In the top left-hand corner, you have ultraviolet light coming in from the sun. It reacts with organic molecules in the soil. That's another big discovery. Earlier this year, 
we had an announcement that organic molecules had been discovered in the soil of Mars. An organic molecule is a molecule that has carbon in the molecule. It's not life, but life on Earth is based on carbon chemistry. That's why it's called organic. Finding organic molecules in the surface of Mars suggests the possibility that life could be responsible for putting the organics in there, but it doesn't prove life is there. But if there are organics in the surface soil, and we now know there are, and ultraviolet light comes in, the reactions between the two can produce methane. That wouldn't mean life is produced by methane in that situation, but methane could have produced those organics. Another possibility on the bottom right is olivine rocks in the soil react with water. We know there's water. The water in the olivine produce methane that bubbles out of the ground. Another possibility on the top right is that methanol and formaldehyde react with sunlight and they get stirred up by dust devils on Mars and produce methane. And the last one in the bottom left corner would be microbes under the soil, microbes in those lakes underneath the surface. None of these processes are proven to exist on Mars. All of these processes could produce the methane that we're seeing. Now, one of the oddities about those methane measurements is that they disappeared. After February of 2014, no more methane. The Curiosity team is seeing methane, and it actually is a very small amount of methane, less than one part per billion, that goes up to two parts and back down again that appears to be seasonal. That amount of methane could be produced by non-biological processes, but it also could be produced by biology. We just don't know yet. So Question? Yes, Are the one. seasonal, uh, would the other mechanisms for creating methane also be seasonal? The other mechanisms probably also would be seasonal, so I don't think that, that helps tells us, us anything. one way or the yeah. other. Okay. What we have to do is keep measuring the methane to find out, but the presence of any methane on Mars means the possibility that life exists on Mars today, it's out there. It could really exist. Now, there's one other plausible source for this methane, and that is that we brought it with us from Florida. <laughs> this may be the most expensive experiment ever designed that proved life exists on Earth. <laughs> that spacecraft sitting on the ground in Mars absorbed methane from the atmosphere in Florida that methane went with them to, Mar to Mars. The, the scientists on the Curiosity team know that. They have tried to account for that in their measurements. But it is possible that they have discovered terrestrial methane rather than Martian methane. It's hard to figure. Science is hard. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this evidence puts out there for us the possibility that life exists on Mars today. It doesn't prove it exists. And I think the odds from this are against it because there are other possible sources, but this could be evidence of life on Mars, and that's pretty incredible. If life could exist on Mars, and this is where Laura was calling me out earlier, we have an interesting question to ponder, and that's why I want to take you somewhere else. So Europa <laughs> is a moon of Jupiter. Europa is a warm moon of Jupiter. The tides heat up Europa. The rock has settled to the center. The water has bubbled up to the surface because it's lighter. And this is a cartoon sketch of the inside of Europa, where you have an icy crest and a subsurface ocean. And scientists are very, very certain that Europa has this subsurface global ocean. Beneath the surface of Europa is liquid water. And it's warm. It doesn't get sunlight, but we know there's life on Earth in the deep ocean where there's no sunlight. Life could exist in these oceans. It has the water, it has the heat source, you've got the magnesium and the calcium and the carbon and everything else you need to build up life. We have seen geysers erupting from the surface of Europa, water geysers coming out. Those geysers could have microbes in them being spewed out from these subsurface oceans. I want to take you somewhere else. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. Enceladus also is warm. We have also seen water ice geysers erupting from the surface of Enceladus. Here it's even more spectacular. 
those geysers also could have bacteria or microbes being erupted into space. Europa and Enceladus are two places that planetary astronomers desperately want to go back to. And there's already a Europa mission in the planning stages. Why do we want to go back there? Because those are two places where life could exist in our solar system. In September last year, almost a year ago, NASA had a mission, the Cassini mission, that was in orbit around Saturn. And the Cassini mission was running out of fuel. Anybody know what we did with the Cassini mission? Yeah. Crashed it into Saturn. We used the last amount of fuel to turn it so it would crash into Saturn. Why did we do that? Because we do not want to take the risk that that spacecraft could crash into Enceladus and contaminate Enceladus because life might exist on Enceladus. A few years back, we had a mission orbiting Jupiter that was running out of fuel. What did we do? We targeted that mission to crash into Jupiter where it would burn up so that in 10 years or 1,000 years or in a million years, it could not possibly crash into Europa because we do not want to contaminate Europa because life might exist on Europa. And where is the closest place in the solar system, the closest place in the entire universe where life might exist? <laughs> Mars. <laughs> Mars is the closest place. And we know life could exist there. We've found a lot of water. There's a lot of water on the polar caps. It's frozen. We now know there's a, a salty lake beneath the south polar caps. There's permafrost. Life could exist on Mars. The methane might be evidence of that life. Yet we're not trying to protect Mars in the same way we're trying to protect Europa or Enceladus. I actually find that puzzling and disturbing. Okay. We may have footprints on Mars in six years. Should we be doing that? I don't have an answer to that question, but I think you should be thinking about that question. What do we need to know before we go to Mars? I think we need to know whether there's life there. I think we can learn an awful lot about the possibility of life on Mars robotically before we send astronauts to set foot on the surface of Mars. And if there is life on Mars, there are three possibilities. One possibility is that life on Mars is DNA-based. If life on Mars is DNA-based, the possibility that life like us came into existence on another planet right next door independently is zero. If life on Mars is DNA-based, then life got started on either Earth or Mars, and an asteroid hit one of the planets and splashed a rock to the other planet and transported life from one planet to the other. And almost certainly, it would have been a splash that took a rock from Mars to Earth, because for all sorts of reasons, that's a whole lot easier, which means we're descended from Martians. We're Martians. That is a possibility. A second possibility is that life on Mars is not DNA-based, in which case we would know that on two planets right next door to each other around the same common star, life came into existence independently. That would be incredible to know. If life exists on Mars, and we go to Mars and we contaminate Mars, and then we find the life on Mars, we may never know whether we're descended from Martians or not. We might never know whether the life we find on Mars is just contamination from the Earth. We also run the risk of destroying the life on Mars. We have a, I won't say proud history, but a lengthy history on this planet of human colonists moving from one part of the planet to the other and wiping out a great deal of the life on the planet that didn't previously have exposure to humanity. The chances of us doing that on Mars, I would say, are pretty good. Which means if there's life on Mars, we run the risk of wiping out the independent biology of an entire planet. Do we want to do that? So I would contend that one of the things we should be talking about as we race to set humans on Mars is whether this is actually a good idea before we know the answer to the question, is there life on Mars? We can probably 
in a few decades, certainly in a century, with the exploration we can do robotically, we can determine to a great deal of certainty whether life exists on Mars. We can drill down to that lake. Now that exposes Mars a little bit to contamination, but I think we probably should take that risk. We can send rovers that can explore and find caves and go inside the caves to look for life on Mars. We can turn over rocks to look for life on Mars. We can do all of that without sending humans to Mars. Because when you send humans to Mars, you need to send life support systems, cargo, habitats, food. When we send humans to Mars, we will contaminate Mars irretrievably. But robotically, we can probably figure out whether Mars is inhabited already without contaminating Mars too much. And if Mars is sterile, let's go to Mars. But if Mars has life, perhaps we should talk about whether Mars belongs to the Martians or whether we have some inalienable right to simply colonize another planet. So I'll leave you with that. I'd love to take some questions. I have a question. Please. Uh, and feel free to have a seat if you like. Um, <laughs> if we, uh, no, it's a hot I seat. Talk to you. It's a really hot seat. <laughs> oh. No, no, this is a, a science question. Uh, is it possible to isolate zones where, you know, if we do go, and the footprint's going to be pretty small because we're not going to be roving around or anything of where humans land, Will that necessarily, I mean, are there enough transport mechanisms and so forth where just our presence on Mars will so mess can we the land whole thing in a, up? Can we land in a little spot and not contaminate the rest of the planet? Mm -hmm. No. Mars has global dust storms. Okay? The atmosphere is thin, and anything that we place in, in the air there, it's going to spread across the planet within two years because it has these global dust storms every two years. So I don't think there's any way for us to not contaminate Mars once we try to put humans there. Yeah. Would we not have already considered the contamination of Mars from the probes we've sent, like Viking and uh, other ones that have, uh, and the Beagle too, that have already landed on the surface that may have already had microbes on it already? Have we already contaminated Mars with the, with the probes who've already landed on the surface of Mars? Yes, we have, but not at the level that we would with, with human footprints on Mars. The, the Curiosity rover on Mars, almost certainly some terrestrial bacteria went with the Curiosity rover to Mars. No matter how well we try to sterilize these spacecraft, the chances of a few bacteria hitching a ride are pretty good. But the atmosphere of Mars is very thin, and the radiation at the surface of Mars is very harsh. So those creatures that might get out of the spacecraft probably will be sterilized very quickly and won't spread across Mars. The stuff that stays inside the spacecraft is inside the spacecraft. So I don't think we've contaminated Mars in a significant way yet. Again, I would say that because of all the resources we need to place on Mars in order for humans to survive. You know, SpaceX is talking about dropping dozens, even hundreds of payloads onto the surface with you know, 3D printers and food and everything else, the habitats these colonists will need. That's a lot of stuff. And you can't sterilize all that stuff, and that stuff will spread. Yes, back, all the way in the back. Um, you said DNA can, will DNA um, independently rise on Mars and Earth? Why, why couldn't it independently rise on other? Why couldn't DNA arise independently? It could, but I think the chances that the same chemical design for life would arise independently and identically, I think that's incredibly <coughs> small. I think if life arises independently, the chances are it will find a different mechanism. It may still be carbon-based, that's probably likely, but for it to be DNA, I just think that is very hard to sell that idea. Yes. Uh, yes, I was wondering if people like yourselves are um, kind of putting the word out to folks like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos to consider staying their horses a little bit before more information is found out. Are people like me putting the word out? By showing up here I am? Elon Musk has not called me up to talk about this yet. Okay? Jeff Bezos has not called me up to talk about this yet. There are people talking about it, but I think it's 
in the whisper stage, if anything. I think humanity collectively desperately wants to go to Mars. Do I think my talking about it is going to slow us down? Probably not. But I do think we ought to be talking about it. I, I think the chances of slowing us down are very, very small, but they're not zero. And I think we could wait 30 years. That will disappoint some people, but that would be enough time, I think, to determine with a great deal of certainty whether Mars is sterile. So let me ask you a question I asked you on the live stream, but then said you don't have to answer it now, answer it Friday, which is how could we possibly do that? I mean, there is no single global government. There, you know, there are many entities, different nations, different corporations, all with plans, as you pointed out in your first few slides. So how would we, how could we even effectively, or would it have to be? Uh, I think stopping our race to Mars would be extremely difficult at the moment. It would have to be an inter international agreement, and we're not very good at following or enforcing or agreeing to anything international. But we would certainly have to do that. We do have a very few examples where we've gotten this sort of thing right. The ozone hole, closing the ozone hole, stopping destroying the ozone layer. That was an international protocol, an international agreement. We decided to do it. We did it. We're not doing so well with global warming. <laughs> but we did succeed with the ozone problem that shows we can succeed. Now, if the international community agrees to put the brakes on, there could be some entrepreneur that will build a rocket in a cave on an island in the Pacific Ocean and, and go to Mars. <laughs> and you couldn't prevent that because being able to launch rockets into space is almost easy now. It's expensive, but lots of people have figured out how to do it. So is there any international law in place right now that prohibits or requires a level of certification or review or approvals to I, do this? Or is to that- To launch a rocket or to go to Mars? No, to go to Mars. I don't believe there's any- Well, that would require launching a rocket, right. of course, but- I don't think there's any international law or national law. There's no you know, United States law that says an individual citizen can't build a rocket and go to Mars, right? Perhaps because no one's thought to enact that law, okay? but to my knowledge, there's no law in any country that says you can't decide to go to Mars and go there. But since it would take you know, a few hundred billion dollars to put together a program to get a rocket and astronauts to Mars, this isn't something that very many individuals could pull off at the moment. So I don't think we have to worry about very many entrepreneurs doing this on their own. But legally, I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have time. I think you, so I'm going to kind of go around. The groundwater, is it more than 10 meters down? And what month was your book published? The book was published this May. So it's been out for four months or so. The, the groundwater just discovered the lake underneath the South Pole. That's a about a mile deep? Uh, yes, okay. mm -hmm. one and a half kilometers yeah. deep, yeah. So it's not very accessible. We have the ability, just like we have the ability to drill cores in the Gulf of Mexico, we can drill down to it, but it's not easily accessible water. How about groundwater that's closer to the surface? There's no liquid water that's been found close to the surface. There's permafrost that's been found, there's ice that's been found but no liquid water <coughs> reservoirs that have been found closer to the surface. Can you help me understand what the consequences are of contaminating Mars? <laughs> if Mars is sterile, there are no consequences. If Mars has active biology today, then the main consequence is the risk of wiping out Martian life. The next qu consequence is simply a scientific one of interest to me, which would be discovering whether life on Mars is truly independent of life on Earth, or, or we are descendants of Martian life. And if we contaminate Mars and we find DNA-based life, we won't know whether that's Martian or contaminant. Um, uh, yeah, Tony. Can you say anything about uh, reconsidering the Viking results, and maybe re recalling what those were? Reconsidering the Viking results. Yeah. There's a whole chapter in the book. You can read about it. Okay. That's great. Okay. That's, that's a short and sweet answer. But the Viking results made 
some discoveries that a very few, few people think might be evidence of life on Mars. Very few. Okay? Those very few people still think it, there might be evidence for life on Mars. But most scientists think the Viking evidence does not support life on Mars. Assuming that there was liquid water, um, do they have any theories as to how that would have gotten down to that level? Uh, Mars just started with a lot of water, just like the Earth. Mars was a water-rich planet. The big question for NASA for the last 25 years in studying Mars is to look for the water. And we found lots of water. We also found lots of evidence that some of Mars's water has escaped to space. So Mars may have lost 85% of the water it started with or it may still have most of that water underground. Mars still is a water-rich planet. So the, the question simply is, where is the water hiding that's still in Mars? Mars is cold, so Mars can't have lots of lakes on the surface. They'd be frozen. And we don't see any evidence of lakes on the surface anyway. But how could the water get down there? It just was there in the first place. Mars had water. It didn't have to... to find the water. Comets can also bring water to a planet, and that may be one source of both the Earth's water and Mars's water. But Mars is and was a water-rich planet. Yes? If there was more than one bacteria in Mars, wouldn't there be like a thousand mice on Mars? If there's more than one bacterium on Mars, what was the second part of that? Wouldn't there be more life on Mars? If you find even one bacterium, there must be a lot of life. The chances of us just stumbling across one place with life and being lucky because the rest of the planet is sterile is pretty small. So if you find life anywhere, that probably means there's lots of life on Mars. But almost certainly, any life on Mars is hiding beneath the surface. The surface itself is sterile because of the radiation from space. But inside caves, in permafrost, in lakes beneath the surface, anywhere on the planet, you could find life. And if you found it anywhere, then I'd be willing to bet it's everywhere. And I would add to that that one of the distinguishing characteristics of life is that it reproduces. So uh, um, it would be very uh, unusual to have just one. <laughs> um, second to last. So if we found that there was DNA-based life on Mars, would you be able to determine whether it is recently diverging or diverging three billion years ago from the strains on Earth just by comparing the sequences? If we found DNA-based life on Mars, could you tell whether it diverged from life on Earth a few billion years ago or more recently? I'm not a biologist, so I couldn't answer that question, but I would think you could. You could do you know, sequencing of the DNA and see how divergent it is from modern and ancient species of life on Earth and try to figure that out. That would eliminate the contamination problem then. You might be able to do that. So I'm going to um, ask my last question, and I'm going to ask it in general and ask everyone to give it some thought, uh, because in a minute we're going to turn off the lights and look at pretty pictures, and you can mull this. But I'm going to ask it of you specifically, and then I want to know your personal feelings about the answer to this question that you said you're not going to answer. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't have to represent just your own personal feelings about it. Um, and that is, uh, and then I asked you this the other night, you know, bacterium, schmacterium, who cares? They're little, they're, they don't have brains. Why do we care about Who cares about, about bacteria? bacteria? You're full of bacteria. Now I have, I think, 10 pounds of <laughs> bacteria me. inside my body. They're part of us. If a bacterium exists, then the possibility exists that bacteria can evolve into more advanced forms of life. So even though that has happened already on Earth, it took a long time. It was hard. If life exists on Mars now, even if they're microscopic life forms, the possibility exists that those bacteria someday might evolve into more advanced life forms. But I actually think that doesn't matter. I think if they exist at all, that's what matters, that it's life. And if it's life that's independent, and again, we don't know if there's life, and we don't know if it would be independent of life on Earth, but if there is biology on Mars that is independent of life on Earth, I think discovering that would be one of the most incredible discoveries we have ever made, if not the most incredible discovery we've ever made. And that would teach us that life is probably abundant in the universe. 
If life can exist independently on two planets in the same solar system, then life is probably easy. The possibility of throwing away the chance to learn the answer to that question when the planet is right next door, I think is foolish. It's right there. We can find out. So it's not the bacterium itself that I care about. It's the scientific answer that comes from the bacterium. But if it's there, I actually want to care about the bacteria most. I think they deserve their own planet.